Hello, welcome to the Friday, October 12th, 2018 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Honolulu, Hawaii. You may remember last year's equation editor vulnerability. The equation editor was a component of Microsoft Office. Microsoft Office has since removed this component because, well, it was sort of one of those legacy components that was apparently quite buggy and Microsoft really didn't want to bother with maintaining it anymore. But nevertheless, exploits still exist that try to take advantage of these old vulnerabilities. Xavier just ran into some malicious spam that exploited just this equation editor vulnerability. It actually didn't run at first in his sandbox because the equation editor was no longer installed in it, but once installed, it would happily download a Trojan and run it. And if you do own a Sony Pravia Smart TV, well, it's a time to update. Sony released an update for these TVs, fixing three vulnerabilities. The most critical of them is a command injection vulnerability. When a user uploads a media file, the file name is mishandled, and as a result, arbitrary code can be executed. The two other vulnerabilities are, first of all, a directory traversal vulnerability that allows you to access files that you're not supposed to access. And the third and last vulnerability is a stack-based buffer overflow. The last vulnerability can be exploited via an HTTP request, so this is potentially remotely executable. Now, you should never expose these TVs to the open internet, so make sure your firewall blocks any access from outside your network. Now, while a lot of home networks uh, rely on NAT to provide some basic isolation here, remember that you may be running IPv6 on your home network. Most ISPs support it now for home users. And while it may be very difficult for an attacker to guess the TV's IP address, they certainly may be able to figure it out if you, for example, use a web browser on the TV and use it to visit a malicious website. And at DerbyCon last week, Tenable presented some interesting research about router OS. Router OS is the operating system running on MicroTik routers. And as part of their research, they show how to, for example, run the system in a virtual machine to help you with further analysis of the operating system. They also released a number of new vulnerabilities that they discovered during their work. Now, I wouldn't call any of these vulnerabilities sort of outrageously dangerous, but there is a remote code execution vulnerability that does require authentication. So just as a reminder, make sure that you do use strong passwords, that you don't expose the admin interface of these devices, and that you keep your systems up to date. In particular, since Microtech had a vulnerability in the past that did allow access to the passwords. And talking about reverse analysis, John Bergbaum from Forcepoint has published another blog post with tips to reverse engineer WebAssembly. He's going over some static code analysis tools and how to apply them to WebAssembly. If you're not familiar with WebAssembly, WebAssembly is a relatively new standard. It's essentially bytecode that you can load in your browser as an alternative to the more interpreted JavaScript. And well, it's supposed to be faster, so we certainly see some websites implementing it. Also start seeing it in malicious JavaScript or malicious websites uh, where they're using it, for example, for crypto coin mining. And since unlike JavaScript, where even obfuscated JavaScript is still essentially text, WebAssembly is bytecode and as such much more resistant to reverse analysis than just plain old JavaScript. 
And well, if you are one of the few websites that are still running certificates that have been signed by Symantec back in the day, you just got a little bit of good news. Now, Chrome 70, which is about to be released, will start to distrust these certificates as announced more than a year ago. But Firefox actually decided to hold off on this and wait for at least one more release of Firefox. Firefox to give people a little bit more time to actually change these certificates. The numbers are a little bit all over the place as to how many websites are affected by this. According to one number by Scott Helm, who did a survey, about 1,000 out of the top 1 million websites still use them. So that would be 0.1%. Firefox states 1%. It is a relatively small number, but apparently there are some larger name brand websites among those that have not been updated yet. Well, and that's it for today. So thanks for listening and talk to you again on Monday. Bye.